Welcome. Good evening again. <laughs> Thursday night photo people. I'm Michael David Murphy. I'm digital director for Atlanta Celebrates Photography. This is our fifth and final installment of what we've been calling History Rewound. If you missed a previous week's episode, they're on our YouTube channel, which you can get to quickly and easily at acpinfo.org slash YouTube. Thanks to Fulton County Arts and Culture and special thanks to KEH with whom we conceived this program as a view backward at some of the most celebrated photographers and photographs in the medium. Our organizing principle for this project has been the camera types and formats used by photographers to create some of everyone's favorite images. The photos streaming past includes some of the pictures we've referenced in previous weeks, a few we'll be getting into tonight. And each week I like to point folks back to the week one introduction where I talked about the canon of pictures and the established history of photography. Like last week, it's important to remember why the history of this medium lacks diversity of all kinds, while consistently asking all of us what we can do to widen it, to create a more representative future for this medium. Tonight, for our last episode, we're, we're going big before going home as we turn to look at large format cameras and the varieties of photographers who've utilized the format and leaned on its unique characteristics to create incredible work. Like last week, just stick with me. We'll end up back here, hopefully in about 25 minutes, if all goes well, and I'll be able to field your questions then, <clears throat> if you have them, just pop them into the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And let's go. Uh, large format cameras are still in widespread use. They have a long history of achievement and excellence, but before we dive into looking at some examples, let's take a look at KEH's video. Large format film cameras, while being less common than their smaller cousins, represent the ultimate in image resolution. Consisting of a fairly simple design, the large format camera generally offers no automated features. Instead, this light proof box requires its user to act methodically and deliberately. Shutter speed and aperture controls are generally found on the lens itself instead of the camera body. And framing and focus controls require tilting, rotating, and shifting both the lens board and the film plane. While this process is certainly more involved than a simple point and shoot, it also gives the user superior image control, allowing for a precise focal plane adjustment and shifts in perspective. These cameras come in many different shapes and sizes, recording to individual sheets of film loaded one at a time, as opposed to a single roll of film containing many exposures. These large format film sheets are available in varying sizes, the most common being four by five inches. This extra large film provides a detail rich negative that can be blown up to many times the original film size when printing without suffering any loss in image clarity. Popular in photojournalism and press photography for the first half of the 20th century, many large format cameras fold down for transportation and convenience. Other models work on a rail based system, forming a tube like light box that's more versatile but less convenient. The interchangeable design of the lenses, boards, and bellows makes the large format camera truly customizable by its user. This attention to detail and ability to customize one's camera provides a photography experience unlike any other. To this day, many professional fine art and landscape photographers find the slower manipulation of large format cameras to be calming and purposeful when compared to the faster workflow of 35mm cameras. With no automation in between the photographer and subject, this allows for a more contemplative experience that hands total control over to the user. Excellent, thank you, KEH. I, I wanna start tonight kind of with a nod back to last week uh, where I was speaking about photography as a kind of wish to an unknown audience in the future as referenced by this photo from Malik Sidibe. And I thought I'd take that same idea and talk briefly about this large format photograph by Margaret Bourke White from 1937 of Americans lined up for food relief in Louisville, Kentucky due to flooding of the Ohio River. 
This is a nine by 13 photograph, a gelatin silver print that was printed decades later in 1970. It's in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art and this is kind of how it looks. I wanted to show it like this to call attention to one of the supreme pleasures from large format cameras and the huge negatives they produce is this ability to make a print at any size, but especially something relatively small like this uh, when seen up close, photo photographs like this can appear to be talking directly to you, cajoling even, whispering the secrets of, of its making. You can learn something from the faces in this photograph about what hardship feels like or what it might feel like to have to ask for help in the face of losing everything. And it's the smallness of this particular print that sets that condition of communication. So Burke White and, and the Whitney is asking you to kind of step up, to get close and dive in and get lost in the details. Real darkroom prints are even better contact prints. So let's say an eight by 10 negative printed to an eight by uh, 10 piece of paper made from large format negatives are one of photography's great wonders. And here I've just been talking about what this picture is rather than about what this picture is. In the 30s, there was an anti-labor union group and they stood against government regulation, especially the beginning of this post-depression era New Deal. They were called the National Association of Manufacturers and they created public billboards like these, thousands of them across the country to make people feel good about working while so much of America had yet to bounce back. They were a kind of propaganda essentially, not unlike what we're seeing now in this election cycle. And this example here uh, from Dorothea Lange shows the manufacturers taking credit for gains made by labor unions to secure higher wages from employers those employers who were also part of the National Association of Manufacturers. So just a little bit of background about what that setup it was. It's this Ouroboros of sorts, <laughs> this circularity <clears throat> came through in a photograph we uh, talked about this spring from Stephen Crowley made early in the pandemic in Silver Spring, Maryland. There's a replica of that old billboard project uh, contrasted against our very real pandemic in 2020, the iconic cell phone and earbud, further date stamp the picture. And again, later this summer, <clears throat> we see Bork White's original large format photograph come around again in a scene from a sci-fi show on HBO where the White family in the blue sedan are fully experiencing the high living standard of the American way while African-Americans in the street are experiencing a different kind of standard, which is all to say photography has this keen sort of power that persists across decades in unpredictable ways, whether the image is made with a Graflex press camera or a contacts rangefinder on the beach in Normandy, as we talked about week one, or the South Pacific with a large format press camera. This is Joe Rosenthal's Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima. The reason I'm including it here is to recognize two things. How different a moment can be when it's stilled by the camera shutter, when compared to that same moment made at the same time from a similar vantage point with a movie camera, and to point out how details can combine together to create iconic images that, again, like Bork White's photograph, can have a real life of their own, far further than ever intended. Here's a contrast. There's Joe Rosenthal's picture on the left, and then there's newsreel footage on the right. I wanted to hop out of the screen share and show you the footage on the right as it, as it, as it moves at probably, what, 12 frames per second? But this moment, I, I, don't, I don't want to risk it uh, technically, this moment is just over in a second and a half. Um, we think about 
Joe Rosenthal's picture like this as expressed in monuments that were made all over the country, that this, maybe they're posing or maybe they were just moving slow, but it was just so super fast. And again, the per person, uh, cinematographer shooting a uh, movie film was just on the right of Rosenthal as they're facing the same scene. Rosenthal's kind of on the left, a little lower. The movie is probably maybe six feet, 10 feet to the right of Rosenthal. And Rosenthal ends up with this. To dip further into the large format style, I thought for the first time this entire month, we take a look chronologically for a couple of minutes at a few standout practitioners of the style, the format, with their preferred instruments. So here's a five years older than Margaret Bork White was this gentleman, Arthur Felig, also known as Ouija. He photographed in the 30s and 40s with a four by five press camera with a flash attached, most notably at gruesome crime scenes. Something very similar to this, just a box as we saw in the KEH video, pops open, lens inside, all kinds of stuff. Uh, portable, yet still pretty unwe unwieldy and, and, and uh, uh, difficult to work with in and around developing situations. And in our first week, we talked about this picture made by Martin Mincacci in Liberia and how it went on to inspire, inspire Cartier-Bresson to commit himself to a certain style of photographing. And for Ouija, as for Mincacci, the large format press camera offered this kind of radical simplicity. You can set it at F16, a 200th of a second with some flash bulbs, lock the focus at 10 feet, at night and go out and get a real predictable outcome. Here's Ouija with his particular rig. He was wily enough to understand the economics of the media landscape, which may not have changed. If it bleeds, it leads. Crime often comes out at night, which is when Ouija really went to work on the Lower East Side of Manhattan or at the Metropolitan Opera House, where he mostly staged this seemingly candid photograph in November of 1943. Ouija's milieu couldn't have been more different than our next photographer, born right at the same time around the turn of the century, Ansel Adams here with his large format camera. His fingers are holding the shutter release, the cabled shutter release. Adams' popular landscape work was shot on large format for very different reasons than Ouija. Large format offered the highest quality because it had the biggest negative and Adam's particular genius was being able to create a negative that had the largest spread of dynamic range from which he could do his true composition in the dark room, uh, deciding to highlight here or dodge there. And it's from Ansel Adams in part that the large format camera acquires a kind of ethos associated with it that really remains to this day. These are cameras of capital S, <laughs> serious photographers, meaning anyone who has the patience and fussiness to still be wrangling with a large format camera in this day and age must be serious when there are so many other paths of speed and convenience, especially in our digital era. A young photographer experimenting with large format might explore how the curiosity expressed in a public exchange of what is that camera? Why are you using it? It could really lead into an interesting photography project. A uh, large format camera on a tripod might be this perfect web in which you could ensnare a subject's willing and consensual interest. So why does anyone continue to choose to shoot in such an anachronistic, unwieldy format? Well, in Jeff Wall's case, that's Mr. Wall on the right by the wall the camera doesn't necessarily offer Adam's ability to create a richness of tones from dark black to the brightest white. It's more about being the largest possible canvas with which he can create huge light box transparencies for museum installations or very large prints for those same walls. And because so many photographers who specialize in making photographs for fine art exhibition spaces continue to create work with these large format cameras and teach 
photography using the same equipment, we're living with large format as this kind of gold standard of uber clarity and this immaculately deep resolution. There are artists like Wall who are continuing to innovate with what the camera can do, with what the format can do to increase the scope of what large format might render and how that might enhance the potential power of an artwork. This is Tina Barney, <laughs> seen here in a context that looks very much like a Tina Barney photograph, her hand again on the shutter release cable. She has an uncanny ability to operate a slow, unwieldy system in a way that's very much in the same spirit as 35 millimeter street photographers, but within spaces like this of family gatherings and formal portrait situations. Someone like Richard Misrock has been leaning on the large format ability to pack a wallop for viewers, especially when issues of the natural environment are at stake, as seen in his Cancer Alley work from Louisiana that was here at the High Museum in uh, about 2012. And if you want people to understand the impact of human decisions on the environment in the American landscape, it helps to be able to make things large and potentially even overwhelming in scale rather than quietly framed as a small eight by 10, right? And there are some photographers like Joel Meyerowitz here. I wonder what the last thing the, the photographer said to him to, to get that expression was. He, he understands large format as just one of the brushes in his paint, bo paint box. I mean, if he needs to scale up in terms of offering the kind of impact that Miss Rock's work is known for, he can, as when he was photographing the ruins of the World Trade Center in 2001. His agnosticism to a particular format has resonance for all photographers and that he's demonstrated clear and exacting skill throughout his career, regardless of what camera or format might be in his hands. This final example here from his Cape Light series, when he had first switched over to large format from small camera street photography. On the other hand, David Lynch, he can fire his, his own shutter release cable here. As long as somebody helps out behind the camera, there's another uh, gentleman behind the uh, dark cloth there. Uh, which is the Gregory Crutzen ethos, using an entire film production crew, including a camera operator to enable both pre-production and post-production of his extravagantly layered and digitally processed constructions. Right now, we're fortunate there are large format photographers who are perfectly pitched for our present and future, like Dina Lawson, who won the Hugo Boss Artist Prize last week. You might remember her lecture during ACP Fest recently. She's pictured here <laughs> with her hand on the shutter release cable, the traditional pose. And there are plenty of young artists like Dina Lawson bringing their skills and dreams to large format, especially from within this academic tradition uh, where it continues to be taught. And again, that feeds upward into galleries and museums for whom size often matters. And these cameras can deliver this undeniable quality that has the capability not to just cajole and whisper, but to really stand up, own a wall, take over a room and make people forget about video or sculpture or painting. It's a way for photography to declare itself as legitimate and revelatory, and worthy of attention within the context of limited wall space and the finite attention spans of public spaces. Now, this is a project from Richard Rinaldi, who is a large format and iPhone photographer. I'm sure he shoots with all different kinds of photograph uh, cameras, but some of his best work is in this large format style. And this project are, is a photograph of two people meeting who've never met before and them touching. And the date stamp on this one is 2007. 2011. As this year's gone on, obviously this project has more and more resonance and feels more and more of the moment uh, and incredible and almost like a window on a, a lost world, not to get too <laughs> dramatic about it. Um, but he's so 
supremely skilled at using the kind of stable quietness of the big camera to um, elicit something that might not otherwise happen from people who've never met and have never met him. Um, so I think it's an incredible example of kind of contemporary work within this large format style that's extremely relevant to now. And every time I look at it, I see something new and incredible. And uh, I just wanted to share some of these with you tonight. I think this here is our last one. Here's an example of how uh, Richard Rinaldi's Touching Strangers looks as a kind of public installation at a photo fest in Canada in 2014. I'm gonna do something a little bit different tonight. I wanna walk you through a series of images made in large format, but almost as if they were made with an SLR or any other kind of camera. And because they were made while the photographer Gordon Parks was working for the FSA, the Farm Security Administration, the pictures are part of kind of our public document. They're owned by us. They're in the Library of Congress. And you can dive deep and go back and look at them in a sequence. And I want to do that tonight to illuminate a little bit about Gordon Parks and what it's like to work with a sheet film of, of a large format camera. Here he is. You might recognize him from a couple of weeks ago when he was posing with Muhammad Ali. This is with this famous portrait of Ella Watson. And we talked about this uh, photo from Alabama and the segregation story. And just like Margaret Bork White, uh, Gordon Parks is finding newfound relevance. His work's being seen through this kind of contemporary lens. They're remaking it, it's finding its way into a Kendrick Lamar video from a few years ago. This is Gordon Parks on the left, and this is the still from the Kendrick Lamar video on the right. And here's where the series begins. Here's where the sequence begins of these photos that Parks is taking in 1942 when he realizes after his boss leaves uh, the office, it's just him and two women who are cleaning up. Uh, I believe this is in the treasury building. And if you look around, it says Office of the Register. She has a vacuum. There are a, there's a broom over there in the corner and two other kind of uh, cleaning implements. And as you start moving through, you can see that there the the implements. This broom is has moved around. It's a uh, let me see if I can put my cursor over there. I may oh, lost my cursor. So the scene keeps changing and you can see him almost thinking as a photographer, hey, should I go into this doorway? Is my flash getting through the doorway and illuminating her enough? How best to kind of approach it, this situation and talk to this woman about what her life is like. Maybe we can go in the room now and I'll take a photo of her prepping or working or maybe even just uh, putting some loose paper into the fireplace and here's where he starts to begin working with this existing iconography in the office of the American flag of George Washington looking down on somebody actually doing, you know, real back breaking labor. And a similar thing happens here in a different portion of the office where she's standing, she still has her hands on her on the broom handles and behind her is a declaration from Franklin Delano Roosevelt and some kind of official lettering on the wall. And then he comes across as the, the other woman who's cleaning, Ella Watson, and starts kind of working through this scene and trying to figure out how it's going to work. The picture on the right is just, there's nothing, let's say, special about it. And it's I think it's great to show non-special pictures made by great photographers and kind of special moments to show how do we sculpt these things together? How do we move these elements in a way that can create something that will work? Maybe he should put his strobe on, or his light on the floor and it'll help her broom stand out or let's walk over here to the stairs and maybe there's something about 
ascending the stairs and sweeping with a broom. So you can see a photographic mind at work trying to work the scene. It says Washington DC government charwoman. Charwoman was the term for uh, somebody who cleans, uh, who provides for a family of six on her salary of $1,080 per year. She's been a federal employee for 26 years. Here she is doing some work in the restroom. And then we go back to merging her now with some of the iconography that's in the office. Let's place her uh, cleaning supplies here next to this adding machine. I guess that might be an early adding machine slash calculator. And standing in front of the, let's hit the bullseye, everybody payday, um, and having her uh, unique expression on view. So uh, he was kind of following his boss, Roy Stryker's advice. He, this is a quote, he began a conversation with her and over the course of an hour, she took him through her lifetime of drudgery and despair. Parks asked her to stand with her mop and broom before a huge American flag on the wall saying, now think of what you just told me and look into the camera. And we start getting to this. So the flags on the wall behind her, those are typewriters that are covered on the right on the desks there. And you see this broom that might even kind of be wet uh, on the rug and it's leaning against an office chair. So the, and, and then there's an upended broom. So these elements are really close to getting together, but there's maybe it's a little too cacophonous. He has to separate out the subject a little bit more and kind of get things more elemental, which he does here and achieves it. The mop has moved to the right, it's behind her. It's kind of fading out of focus. The flag itself is not as in such stark relief. It's kind of blurring out behind and the broom is in the foreground, perfectly in focus, and we can get her expression now too. And Parks continued to photograph with Ella Watson. I think that he showed these pictures to Roy Stryker and Stryker told him to kind of like, well, why don't you go home and see what her family life is like? And he followed that direction and continued shooting her in her apartment that she shared with her her adopted daughter and grandchildren. And here, same situation, Parks keeps looking for things and keeps kind of working the particular scene. Let's have them on the beds on the left. Let's have the daughter in the background and have, make sure that she's lit. Let's do, stage a scene where somebody's walking in the door, which is on the lower right there. And then just kind of the, grand uh, kind of family cacophony of just <laughs> people are eating and stuff's happening. And he's able to work, especially with this image on the right, the daughter's image in the mirror with the family photo of ancestors on the bureau while the grandchildren are being fed and are curiously looking back at, at Gordon Parks in the camera. And we get a larger kind of view of that same uh, same sequence here, and then a standalone portrait, which is beautiful on the left, and then a really contemplative, meditative, both women looking out the window in front of the religious iconography on their bureau. And he even continues, he goes down, she lives above a Chinese laundry, um, which is here with FDR again on the, um, on the wall. And here it says, Johnny Liu, owner of laundry under the apartment of Mrs. Ella Watson, a government charwoman. And you can tell that he brought these back to Stryker and it was like, oh, that maybe you were working through something and it was getting there, but maybe it wasn't exactly perfect. And again, using American Gothic as inspiration, settling on this, uh, portrait of Ella Watson is the standout image. Um, I hope you like that little tour just showing how these things can kind of come about and land in the way that they do. To close tonight, I thought I'd just end with this piece. It's called Camera Placed on My Chest While Lying on the Ground at Night for More Than Two Hours. It's by the artist from Maine named Caleb Charland. 
who in the tradition of conceptual artists has told you exactly how he's made the photograph through the title. And if there's anything to take a lesson from right about now, it might be if you're able to remember to find the time to look at the stars and breathe, or even better, like Caleb Charlin, maybe make a photo of how your breath renders as star trails. With that, I'll stop the screen share here and open the Q&A and see if there's anything to address. And either way, as I said at the beginning, this recording will appear on YouTube at acpinfo.org slash YouTube. And I wanna thank KEH for their informative videos and in support of this effort this month in Fulton County Arts and Culture, and especially to those of you who tuned in. Let me see if I can get my mouse over here. Stop the share, see what's going on in the Q&A. Okay, I think we're good in the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Michael at acpinfo.org. And again, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you soon.